Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show... We have a replay of Cecilia Mecca's episode. Yes, we do, because we're taking a break this summer. Yeah. So we're we're coming to you live every, with a new episode every other week. And so yes. we're, uh, we're doing so this our... one. Will, yeah, this one will be a replay of Cecilia Mecca. She talked about how she learned to reverse engineer her books, like how mm-hmm. to take the idea and then reverse engineer the uh, book from the idea. And I thought it was very interesting. It was one of our mm-hmm. earlier episodes, so mm-hmm. probably won't be as smooth or if ours are ever really smooth ever smooth and our sound's <laughs> never great so you know it'll be just like normal yeah <laughs> yeah so what have you been doing this week well last week well this past week I've been teaching swim lessons at my daughter's house for seven hours something oh like gosh. that yeah it's been a long day but it's been fun I enjoy it a lot and uh so uh I've been doing that but before that we went to EnglishCon together and we got to have breakfast with some of our listeners and it was mm-hmm. so super fun it I, was just being able to not just the breakfast, but other people who came up to us and told us they really love the podcast and that they, um, you know, just said such nice things about us and that made me feel better. Um, <laughs> and then you and I and Kimber Swain were on a panel yeah. discussing um, series. And so mm-hmm. that was that was fun, too. So yeah, the whole thing yeah. was just really fun. Yes, it was great. And mm-hmm. I enjoyed meeting everyone in person. Mm-hmm. It's so much better to meet somebody in person than yes. chat online with them. It was yeah. great. It is. And it's, yeah. It, it got, was awesome. Yeah. I got lots of really good ideas of things to mm-hmm. try. I have a long list. I'm trying not to like do everything, trying mm-hmm. to do everything, you mm-hmm. know, trying to mm-hmm. narrow down what I want to focus on. But right. um, that was really good. The panel went well. And <laughs> Yeah, I was a little nervous about that, but it went okay. I was too. It was weird <laughs> because I'm normally not, but I was a little nervous, yeah. but I thought it went well. And uh, yeah, I really, um, yeah, I had a list of things too. And, and what was really good for me was it was just real affirming that, you know, right now I don't have to work. I don't have to write mm-hmm. in this season of my life, but I, but there are some admin things that I had not done or had been putting off or something mm-hmm. that could really improve my sales. Mm-hmm. And then there were some new things that were uh, discussed. And so I've done a few of those already this week. And mm-hmm. um, I don't, I've seen a little bit of a difference, but you know, it takes a while. Yeah. And so um yeah, it was just really good for me. I, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was. It was one of the one of the good, best conferences I've been to, mm-hmm. and um, I've always enjoyed Nink, but this one was right up there with Nink. Yeah. And I enjoyed just um, being out and meeting people again. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I'm an introvert, an introvert, so that says a lot. <laughs> but mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, we're gonna do a. a but whole that episode. was your conference wife. Yes. True. Your Which, you're my podcast okay. wife and I'm your <laughs> conference wife. So there yes. you go. <laughs> and we're going to do, which was very helpful because you know, I'm not super extroverted. So it's very good to have an extrovert around who will help you meet people when you are feeling a little introverted. But um, we are going to do like an in depth episode. We're going to mm-hmm. uh, online this week and it'll come out next week. And we're going to talk about, you know, kind of what we learned and so, some tips and ideas for like how to. Uh, meet people, how to network, and basically, I'm going to interview Jamie mm-hmm. so we can figure out <laughs> our tips on that. <laughs> so, but then for me this week, I've been you know just trying to get back into the routine mm-hmm. after being out of town. But then right. I was also on a um, Find Away Voices and Draft Digital are doing a series of interviews with authors about audiobooks and basically mm-hmm. you know writing and craft. And so I did that this week, and it was really good. It was live but they do have a replay up. So Mm -hmm. I'll put the link to that in the show notes. And so they had like this week or when I did it, um, I was for mystery and then they're going to have 
I think next up is romance author mm-hmm. and just all different kinds of genres for all the whole month of June because June is audiobook month. So it was really good. So I'll put a link That's to great. that in the notes and yeah, <laughs> no more raccoons. Life is good. Uh, that's awesome. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah. We're just uh, living through the Texas heat now. So. Yes. Yes. Now yeah. we hunker down and stay indoors. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, unless you're doing swimming, swimming <laughs> but then you're in the pool. So that's okay. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. I had, I, uh, you know, slather the sunscreen on, but I must have missed a spot on my chest um, <laughs> the other day because I have this one spot that's really tender. And I was like, wow, oh, how did that happen? So yeah. anyway, but yeah, yeah, it's been fun. So we should get on with the episode. Cecilia's great. Uh, she's one of the people I listen to yes. when I and go to when I have questions. So let's listen yes. to her. All right. So here's Cecilia. Cecilia Mecca is the author of steamy historicals that transport readers to another time and place. She also writes paranormal romance about the ultimate bad boys, sexy, wealthy, and swoon-worthy vampires. She can be found in Northeast Pennsylvania, chai in hand, thinking up new ways to tame both medieval and paranormal bad boys. And she's also the creator of a great Facebook group for authors launching indie. Hi, Cecilia. Hi, ladies. How are you? Good. Hi, Cecilia. Good morning. So uh, you're in your cozy sweater and I'm in a tank top because <laughs> <laughs> because it's winter in Texas and that's yes, what we exactly. wear. Yeah, that's what we wear. <laughs> I am so jealous. I wrap myself in this thing every day. It's so cold up here. Oh, uh, well, it looks very nice and cozy. <laughs> So, Cecilia, tell us what genres, uh, we just went over it in the bio, but give us a little more information about the genres you write in and, um, yeah, just anything you want to talk to us about about that. Yeah, so I started off in medieval romance. I never know if I call it Scottish romance, historical romance, medieval romance, Scottish historical (laughs) medieval romance. (laughs) So we could go with any of those, but uh, that's kind of my main genre, so to speak. Last year, I launched a a series in paranormal romance with the vampires, and that was a lot of fun. And then this year, I'm going to dip my toes. I'm going to put my big girl pants on and dip my toes into contemporary romance as well. So, oh, yeah, I know. And uh, Jamie doesn't know this yet, but she's going to help me. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it'll be tons of fun. But now are you doing that under Cecilia Mecca or? No. So I've learned my lesson. I'm happy to talk about that at some point. You know, Mm -hmm. I think it's actually a perfect topic for this particular podcast. Yes. yes. I've certainly learned, um, you know, what not to do with uh, launching a new genre. So this one will have a pen name. Secret. Secret pen name for writing. Yeah. So secret um, in that I I (coughs) have no problem telling people in terms of authors. Um, I think it's going to make sense for people to know it's me. What I really want is for my existing readers to not find out about it, at least for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, yeah, Makes I don't know sense. call it secret, secret for readers. Yes. Delayed. Delayed. Yeah. A delayed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so tell us, how did you get into writing fiction? Yeah. So I'm an, I was an English teacher. I think every English teacher secretly, you know, wants to mm-hmm. be, so I've always, um, you know, loved literature. And I taught English for 15 years. And then for my last five years in education, I taught teachers. So I went around to school districts in Pennsylvania and did workshops and things like that on, I was an ELA consultant. So English language arts and writing was one. Um, So I've always really had this desire and I've been reading my entire life. I was a medieval studies minor. So it all kind of fits together. And I've read romance since Sweet Valley High. Um, and I've always had this goal. I want to write a book, but I just never imagined it as a career, uh, until, you know, I put the first book out and then, you know, it did well, the second book did really well. And here I am full time and it's amazing. So I retired, uh, after 20 years in education and have been writing full time. This is going into my third year. That's awesome. That is, awesome. That is great. Yeah, it's yeah. Awesome. Congratulations. It sounds like a nice merging of like your, your interest and like you had a lot of, it sounds like you already had a lot of the research background for it. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I'm a weird bird. I guess I absolutely love the research. It's a part of, you know, I could see someday doing historical fiction and that's a whole different animal, but I love the research. I love medieval studies. I love romance. Um, and I love teaching too. So jumping into nonfiction a little bit with my author group you mentioned. So thanks for that. I I could see kind of tapping into the last few years as a consultant too, and just kind of bringing it all together. 
maybe would have gotten a few less degrees and, you know, that I'm still <laughs> paying money on um, to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. But at least I found it eventually, right? <laughs> That's the important thing. Yeah. I know. So what was the, your first big success? Was it the first book? No, so I'd say the second one. The first book, I actually planned to launch The Thieves Countess until I kind of learned about strategies and then put a pause on that release, went back and wrote a prequel novella, The Word's Bride, and I used that as my lead magnet. And um, so I released those very quickly together and you know made mistakes there talking about what I learned. I released The Word's Bride on Super Bowl Sunday. I have no idea what I was doing. <laughs> When I look back, I laugh. I said, what in the world? Um, I mean, honestly, it wasn't supposed to be a big launch. It was like, okay, let's just get this novella out there so I can start giving it away for free. Um, but, you know, do, I wouldn't do that again. So I put those out in pretty quick succession, and it did okay, and it got some visibility. But the second book, The Lord's Captive, um, in a now-finished series, that's the one that it, it just sold really well. And um, by the time that one was out – maybe even a month or so, two months, I started to look at this completely different. You know, maybe this isn't a hobby. Maybe this could be a career because I was replacing, almost replacing my income Wow. Um, th- at that point. So yeah, so I would say the second one. And, and when I look back, you know, I, I think the cover was really on point. It's still one of my favorite covers. So I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, but I kind of put all of the pieces in place for that one to be successful. But there's been books that have come out since then that weren't as successful as that one. So I I do think some of it is, you know, just right time, right place, luck, time of year. You know, I tried to replicate it. I was like, okay, June is the thing. I will now always punch in June. (laughs) But it's not that easy as you guys know. And the universe goes, uh, just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Good luck trying to pinpoint that. Exactly. Yeah. That's funny. Well, so what do you wish you'd known about um, writing or craft that you, as you look back now? I wish I had read craft books because I, I kind mm. of came into this a little um, with a bigger head than I should have. I was an English teacher. I had studied literature my whole life mm-hmm. and I taught writing. So this was, you know, I at least knew how to write. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. What I didn't know is that writing fiction and specifically genre fiction has its its very own rules. I really hadn't read a lot about three X structure. I knew what it was. Um, so I wrote the thieves countess and I went back. I had to so heavily edit that I probably should have rewritten it, but I wasn't willing to give it up. Um, but just, you know, some simple books, my two favorites are Kathy Yardley rock your plot. And Mm -hmm. for me in romance, romancing the beat, a very short, but great, you know, plot structure book. Those things could just, those two could have really helped me save a lot of time Mm -hmm. and trouble with that first book. So, um, I had wish I read some craft books. And when people come to me now, that's the first thing I do is say, go read Kathy Yardley and start from there. And then at least yeah. understand plot. And, you know, even if you're not a plotter and don't plan to be a plotter, just knowing that inherent um, 3X structure or whatever you use, I kind of have some different ones now that I've tested out. Yeah. Just knowing something with about reader expectations in that specific niche, which for me is genre fiction. Yeah. Yeah. You did a great podcast with Nathan Van Koops about plot books. I thought that was great. I am yeah. a yeah. plot geek too. And so I love that. And I was like, Ooh, new, new resources. So we'll, we'll link to that so people can go find that. If they're yeah, book faces live. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Nathan is fantastic and he's a plot geek too. So we're, you're in the plot geeks club with us. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun yeah. place to be. I never imagined being here to be honest. I was, I was a pantster. And so I, I, came to the dark side. Yeah. Yeah. You can see over my shoulder here. <laughs> Someone's I a bit of a plotter. Did, yeah. No, I'm really not. But I, I've had such, so much trouble starting and then getting stuck that I have forced myself to try to plot. And so I, I was using Romancing the Beats. Um, so I did that this weekend. I love and it. Jamie's it's showing, Jamie's it showing a, a poster board with a bunch of beautiful, bright, sticky notes on it. Yes. So that she's got her book planned out now. Well, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you have a plan. <laughs> I have a plan. So, Cecilia, so tell us about marketing. I mean, what do you do uh, and what you wish you'd known about it when you started? Yeah, so I kind of do. Came, what do you do now? I guess. Yeah. I came from a unique place because I was a blogger for many years. So I had a bit of a platform. So in some ways it was a head start, but not so much because that platform, they weren't book readers and I had never, you know, I had thousands of Twitter followers, but they were following me from my blog, which was kind of parenting hacks and um, pics and things like that. So 
Um, what I wish I had known is about marketing that I know now after three years is how important the package is. And mm. I've known that from the beginning. I've been hearing that from the very first, mm -hmm. you know, course I took in the first broadcast I heard, but now I really get it. And I understand what reverse engineering means a little bit. Um, so for a long time, I thought, okay, I'm coming into this with a platform. So I really did use social media. I didn't advertise, paid advertise for a long time. And even now, it's it's I run a Facebook ad for two weeks when I release. That's it. Um, I run Amazon ads, and uh, you know, so I kind of use that that social media platform. And I still do to mm -hmm. kind of launch. Um, but what I didn't realize then is it's fantastic that I want to write certain things. And I feel like if I write Jeffrey, his brother should have a story. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But is Jeffrey's story compelling enough to sell a book? Does that story necessarily match with, uh, let's say, a, a trope? Um, mm -hmm. Now I'm very conscious of exactly what that package is going to look like. How am I going to market this book over all of my other books? And I think of that now before I even start writing. So I kind of have to marry what I feel, you know, where the muse takes me and also how will this book sell and what will the cover look like? And those are things I never thought of until well after the book was written, you know, so I kind mm -hmm. of went with my muse. I felt like this was the next good book and then, you know, went that direction. Now I'm a little bit more deliberate about a lot more deliberate about that. Right. So when you say package, like what's yeah. in that package? Yeah. Sorry. So the package is, you know, the cover, mm -hmm. the blurb, the mm -hmm. title. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm used to titling books, you know, after sometimes after I sent it to the editor because I'm so bad at it. Now I recognize that title is really, really important and going to pull mm -hmm. people in. Um, so I've completely reversed how I approach a book. So for instance, in the pen name that I mentioned, um, you know, jumping into contemporary, I don't have the story, but I do have the photo that I'm using, the title, the tropes I'm hitting and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. So that's very different than the way I did it when I first started. Right. Yeah. I think tropes are important too. I mean, you know, knowing that trope, um, or at least having one, I, you know, I tend to throw about 16 in, but <laughs> having the one is, is important because that is part of the marketing too. Yeah. Um, interesting. I don't start a book unless I have a title. Really? I always have my titles first. Yeah. Uh, the running from a rock star was actually rock my world until I realized that there were about 12 rock my worlds and about five of them were erotica. And I'm like, Oh, I can't go with that one. <laughs> and then I had to do something else. But after that, they all, I had a title for, uh, yeah, for all my books. I even have titles for books that I haven't, that I'm going to write like next year. I'm not yeah. surprised because you're smart and that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So. Well, I just think that that's how we all think so differently. I mean, you know, we yeah. all just, it, so that, I think that's encouraging though, because you don't have titles and you've been super successful. So I, I think that's really, really awesome. Thank you. Yeah. There's, there's a few ways to skin this cat for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so on the marketing, we wanted to ask you too um, about um, Facebook Live and Facebook groups because you seem to use those and use them really well. So um, do you have any thoughts, ideas, tips on that? Um, things you would recommend people do or don't do? Yeah, sure. So I'm a huge fan of free marketing strategies. Um, mm -hmm. I like organic a lot because it it is free. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> free is I'm good. I'm a fan of that because <laughs> You know, I feel like I'm giving my money and, and I'm happy to pay for ads when they convert and they work well, but it's just so frustrating when they don't. So I'm mm -hmm. constantly on the look for what's the next social media thing that I could also tap into while I'm sim simultaneously learning how to do ads and such. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, it was Facebook page and then, you know, the organic reach on yeah. pages went away. And that's why I migrated over to Facebook Live because Facebook was prioritizing that. Um, I still think Facebook live is fantastic. Now I'm attaching the lives to comments, to bots and doing things a little bit different. Um, groups still have good reach. And that's why I really do focus on that. And I think a lot of, I, I've seen um, some amazing authors do things in groups and I'll be honest, I go in and I get ideas from them. Uh, mm -hmm. Listen to, I can't remember it, but I can certainly give it to you afterwards. One podcast that I think was really kind of life changing in terms of how to be deliberate about groups. Again, being very mm -hmm. strategic about you know, the certain kinds of posts that you're putting up mm -hmm. so that you get engagement. Um, having once a week in a group, something that is relatable, that, that 
really is just fun and you're not selling your book just to reminding yourself, you know, you're not supposed to be selling all the time. And I know that, and I know 80, 20, and I, I get that. But sometimes, especially when a book is coming out, you get so excited, like, yeah. you know, check this out. So you have to remind yourself, okay, once a week, absolutely nothing about a book. And it's just a relatable post. Another day of the week, we're doing a survey again, nothing about the post and not a survey in terms of, I put up an actual survey because those will, they're dead in the water. Um, mm-hmm. Because there's no engagement, people are clicking on a link to take a survey. So mm-hmm. instead, something quick that people could, you could, you know, crowdsource or just a fun survey. Um, mm-hmm. I do a lot of emojis, you know, so choose an emoji or or let's do a GIF celebration or something mm-hmm. like that. But surveying is fantastic as long as you're not using the built-in survey, mm-hmm. um, you know, just kind of encouraging comments. And then, you know, maybe the day after one of those posts that do really well, then you kind of put something out. So knowing I've just engaged a bunch of, um, you know, readers, Facebook likes those posts. So, you know, they're probably mm-hmm. going to give me some slack today. And then after <laughs> that, it's, you know, start the clock again. Yeah. So um, being strategic about it, but also having a lot of fun and just knowing that in my reader group, uh, they're there, yes, to connect with me and yes, to hear about the books. But um, we also just want to have fun and, and, and have a good time. So right. You know, right now we're on, you know, a Henry Cavill kick and we'll just, you know, ride that wave until, <laughs> for a long <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah, for hopefully a long, long time. You know? I actually think I might dedicate a week, a day a week. And I think that could be my new thing. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I was, I uh, was on Instagram and I saw, I follow Colleen Hoover because she's a genius, but she was talking about, um, when she wrote one of her books and I can't remember the name of it now, but a lot of her readers started calling, uh, messaging her and saying the lead character for this book is on American Idol. Like this guy on American Idol looks oh, just wow. like this. And so she reached and then they started mess. The, her fans started messaging him. So she messaged him and just say, Hey, this is what's happening. So they sort of collaborated on some songs for this book, but she said, I wanted to give my readers something special. So she got him to be on the cover of that book. Oh, you're kidding me. Wow. No, and it, like I got chills just saying that because it's like just being so tuned into your readers and wanting to give them that. Yeah. I just thought that was so, so, so smart. And, um, and I think that's the next level stuff, you know, where you really mm-hmm. go from just being in, you know, entertaining your readers to being in this relationship with your readers. And uh, I just, I thought that was just so brilliant. Yeah. And knowing them, I mean, you mentioned probably the most important thing and that is knowing who your readers are and knowing what they want. Everyone says that, but really getting to know them has been, and that's what the Facebook group in the live, because I feel Mm -hmm. like those two are similar. Um, They're really kind of letting me dive in to, you know, what my readers are thinking. That Mm -hmm. is so important. I always thought, well, I know my readers. I'm one of them, right? Mm-hmm. I read historical romance for years and years. Mm-hmm. Um, and to some degree, that's true. But I'm not specifically my readers today, what they're looking for, what they want. Mm-hmm. Why are they in my group? And I've asked that question before, and I'll ask it at least once a month. You know, why are you here? Because those answers are what I want to give them more of. Um, right. I, was, I was at a, you know, I was in social media long before books. And I remember being at a conference once, and this is going to seem really simple, but I thought it was brilliant. There was a keynote speaker, and she was, she was just an expert at social media marketing. And she said, now, listen, I know I'm here to talk about Pinterest, and that's kind of the focus of this keynote speech. But mm-hmm. I will tell you, for every social media channel, your goal is to figure out what's working and do more of that, yeah. period. <laughs> and I'm like, that is so simple. It's obviously nothing I'm not already doing, but yeah. when you look at it, how often are you deliberate or am mm-hmm. I deliberate about figuring out what works and giving them more? And now I schedule a day a month to do exactly that. So what is working here? What are my top Instagram posts? What are my top Facebook group posts? Um, oh, they're liking Henry Cavill. Guess who's mm-hmm. going to show up once a week in my yeah. group? You know, so it's yeah. simple, but I think that that definitely is a useful piece of advice. Yeah, hey, maybe so you smart. Can get, yeah, maybe you can get Henry Cavill to be on your next book, your next book cover. Oh, oh now Fingers we're crossed on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that Hashtag like really... goals. <laughs> that seems feasible. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> I got it. it out there. That's awesome. Um, we'll so try. what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career? Uh, looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? 
I mean, yeah, aside from I know how to write a fiction novel pretty well, <laughs> um, which turned out with some tweaking, it, it was right. So I think one of the assumptions, well, the assumption I made off the top was that this was a hobby, you know, and this was just something that would be fun and never expected it as a career. So that one was big fat wrong. I'm happy to report. Um, <laughs> so I think that was, that was one of the biggies. Um, yeah, that's a, I mean, that turned out well though. It did turn out well. And I'm trying to think of it did, uh, some of the other assumptions. And I think one of them was, and I'm, I think we're going to get into this maybe later, but one of them was, well, if I can do it in this genre, I can do it in another. And that one didn't necessarily turn out to be exactly the way I'd hoped. So yeah, um, yeah. it's not all roses all the time. It's a, no. it's a super fun career and, and I love it more than I've loved anything I've ever done, but it's not without its challenges for sure. Yeah, that is true. Well, so what do you look back on that you've done and think, um, you know, that was probably not worth my time. You know, we all have lots of things like that, but is there anything that comes to mind? Uh, Because I was a blogger, I really did come into this kind of with a blogging mindset. And that was to cultivate every channel. Uh, They say, I don't know, whoever they are, they say sometimes (laughs) pick one or two social media channels. I always go go back to social media a lot because it's something I know and such. They say pick one or two social media channels and really focus on those. But as a blogger, that's not what you do. You're an influencer. You're expected to be everywhere. Um, So I really, and I I had everything but a YouTube channel. I mean, I had one, but I didn't cultivate it. So every year I set off with, okay, this year is going to be my YouTube year and I am going to learn. And I did, I really jumped into YouTube and had some ideas on my channel and I started mapping things out because I wasn't there. Um, and same thing with Pinterest. I'm there. I pin inspiration things, but I know I can have a better Pinterest strategy, hashtagging and organizing my boards and linking back to old books. And so there's a lot I can do there, but I had to give myself permission to not, and to let those things go because, um, I guess one of the assumptions is that I can be a kind of a blogger, but also an author, but they really are two different things. And so as a blogger, my goal is to write blog posts and to pull people into all these, from these channels to my blog posts as an author. Oh, by the way, I also have to write books and that takes time. So when I'm doing that, I can't be doing all these other things. So I've Mm -hmm. kind of, um, scaled those back. So yeah, my YouTube channel is pretty non-existent. My Pinterest page just isn't optimized. It just kind of sits there. Um, but I've had to let those things go. Yeah. yeah. I remember, um, hearing, um, uh, Chris Syme talk about outpost mm-hmm. social media channels where like you have a presence like on yep. Pinterest and you have stuff there, but then you're directing people to your main, like wherever you spend all your time. And to me, that was, I was like, Oh, that is awesome. Because then like you're there, but you don't have to be everywhere all the time. That was like a huge relief to me. Cause I don't know that it's possible to, to do all the things and write all the books. It's just, we're, we're going to kill ourselves if we keep it up. Yeah. And, and you know, if it, it's maybe possible, but not necessarily even worthwhile because yeah. if I did that, then something else isn't happening, the writing the next book or, mm-hmm. and I've learned that some channels are better for authors than others. So I'm a Twitter yeah. girl. I love Twitter. I start my morning every day with Twitter. <laughs> Call me a dinosaur. I love Twitter. Well, yeah. <laughs> Usually I love Twitter, I, I have <laughs> but I do. Um, but I had to let that go too, because it's not the best channel to bring yeah. in readers. It's great to connect with other authors, but it's, you know, not necessarily the best channel. So I love that, you know? And so I, I guess right now, Twitter, um, Pinterest are definitely outpost channels for me. YouTube. Yeah. Nobody's finding my YouTube channel. I actually hope they don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty abysmal, but yeah, I, I, I do like that advice. I agree with it. Yeah. So what's the biggest gamble you've taken in your writing career? Hmm. Let's go back to that mistake. Well, I don't know if it was a mistake, but um, we'll go back to the pen name, the paranormal pen name. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a gamble because I was writing along doing well in historical and there was really no good reason to do that except, again, I was following the muse, right? So I had, after an epic binge of True Blood and Vampire Diaries, Mm -hmm. I was feeling very (laughs) vampire and... (laughs) Let's do this. I got it. Um, even when my husband, who is kind of a partner in this with me, said, you know, that seems like it's going to take a lot of time and we're going to take away from the historical. And But if that's where you really want to be, I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to be here. Like this is I am basically a vampire. So um, <laughs> that that was risky. And, you know, it basically took, I say, five months or so. I was smart about it. I did stockpile historical books. So I didn't oh, have that's good. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I wasn't completely, I am slightly risk averse. So I 
went a little bit ahead. I stockpiled some books so that my readers, my historical readers never went longer. I think it was four months, which is long for me. And definitely it took a hit, but it was four months before they got a new release. Mm -hmm. Um, But in the meantime, I took five or six months to write three um, rapid release paranormal books. And it didn't go the way I'd hoped, but I can't say I regret it for lots of reasons. One, those books are there. They're well-reviewed and someday I will go back to them and do something with them. But I will do it when Vampire is actually um, trending upwards as a market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I hadn't looked at that Um, afterwards, kind of learning lessons. I wish I knew to really take a look at the paranormal market. I had seen other vampire books doing fine, Mm -hmm. um, but it turned out a lot of them were vampire urban fantasy, uh, Mm -hmm. vampire paranormal, the vampire romance. Typically, right now in early 2020 or 2019, they're coupled with some of the other genres that were doing better. So uh, shifters, you know, Mm -hmm. I wish I had put a shifter in there. And yes, I love vampires, but he could be friends with the shifter and that would have really helped, but he wasn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, vampires are one of those things that they cycle, you know, yes. and yeah. so you will be perfectly positioned whenever they come back around and then yep. you can do like a little relaunch or whatever and, and ride that new wave. So, yeah. Then vamp- that's the plan. Vampires are around forever. Yeah. They see, never die. Okay, but I mean, yeah. I know. <laughs> You're so clever. I know. <laughs> I know. Too bad nobody will pay me to be clever. <laughs> Actually, they kind of do. Well, they kind of do. Yeah, I guess they're right. I used to say, too bad nobody pays me to be funny. And I'm like, oh, wait. Hey, <laughs> look. <laughs> hey, look. <laughs> so, that's, so that's, I think, the biggie for me. Yeah. Have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing, Cecilia? So I have, I made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing. Can I, can I actually answer the same way and say yes to paranormal? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> because, you know, in a, in a way it was a mistake. I mean, my, I didn't hit my 2019 goals because I basically took the first few months, four months of the year um, and didn't make the income that I would have with historical. So, mm-hmm. you know, in that way, it was a mistake if you look at it in terms of the short term, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. yearly goals and that kind of thing. But I learned so much. Part of what I learned now about that reverse engineering and having the marketing there Mm -hmm. and, you know, following your muse to a point, all of that I learned because of the paranormal right Mm -hmm. now. And I'm not saying that my next pen name will, you know, just go wild and crazy because of it. I'm jumping into a huge, hugely competitive genre, but I definitely will apply those lessons that I've learned, you know, in terms of one of the biggies, is having a pen name. So I chose not to have the pen name for the paranormal because Mm -hmm. I talked to everybody and it just seemed like that was the way I should go. But it was a mistake. Um, For me, at least, uh, so many of my historical readers came over. I thought it was being very clever to have some of my, you know, historical clan chiefs and English knights 700 years later be Mm -hmm. the vampires in my vampire stories where these historical readers came over that don't typically read that my also bots from day one and since then have always been historical. They actually are beautiful also bots for a historical <laughs> like, like all of my favorite authors and you know, no scammers. They're like pure as can be, but there's zero <laughs> romance. And that's after running Facebook ads, running Amazon, sorry, Amazon mm-hmm. ads to them. I did change to a pen name, like after two books, two of the three, but it, it was a little too late. So mm-hmm. learning that lesson this time, you know, that's why my historical readers aren't going anywhere near this genre for a little while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's one reason we, we want to talk to people about this. Cause it's like, even though it doesn't work out like we thought it, we wanted it to, we still learn things and we can still apply that in the future. So mm-hmm. I think that's awesome. So, mm-hmm. so is there anything that you've stopped doing um, task or goals or things that you've just taken off your list that you think, you know, don't need to do that. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned some, so I definitely, I took off Pinterest. I took off just in a practical sense. I took off trying to create and start a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Um, I I definitely took off being so hard on myself. And I know that sounds, that's kind of a mindset thing. And it's not a very, I try to be practical. It's important Um, though. But it is important. I think last January when I put out the first, you know, paranormal and it didn't do what I expected. I, I had a tough few weeks in that having had success with the historical, I was used to, you know, this is, I put out a book and this is what happens. And this one's going to do at, at least as good or maybe better because it's a bigger audience. And, um, I really had to talk myself off of that 
mm-hmm. you know, those high expectations for myself and just to readjust what the expectations are. And, I, and that lesson also will carry through with this one. I'm going to expect with my first book in the new genre to just build a platform, right? I'm not mm-hmm. going to have the same ex- expectations I did. Um, and again, it's not a practical tip, but I think mindset is important too, because you can easily be defeated in this particular industry because there are ups and downs. And I've learned that um, coming strong out of the gates, you know, success with second book and you leaving your job after, you know, the first six months of publishing comes with a high level, high bar, I guess. You yes. Say. Um, it does. Yeah. And so in some ways, if I started, you know, and just built myself up, I wouldn't have had that that uh, those high expectations. So mm-hmm. I've tempered them a bit and have decided to go a little bit easier on myself. Um, yeah. And that's hard for me to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think when you do that, like leaving the job after six months or, or all the things you were talking, you put a lot of pressure on the next book. Sure. And, and that's not always very fair to, to the book yeah. or to us, you know, and, and uh, yeah, that's definitely. Yeah. Realizing that, and, and, you know, we've talked about this, Jamie, realizing that no two books are really the same. You could do everything right and Absolutely. still not quite hit. And mm-hmm. I, I know that the last book and my, I have a strong series now. I'm very happy with how it's going. Um, I just launched book four and it's doing well. Book three launched on a glitch and I had absolutely no control yeah. over that. It just happened. It was a glitch where Amazon, nothing happened for 24 hours. It was, it was one of those things. Mm-hmm. And so if you do have that pressure, you know, you can really have a few bad days or weeks in this mm-hmm. interview. But now I'm at the point where it's like, okay, so it's a glitch. And this, this launch isn't going to be where I want it to be, but the next one hopefully will be. And mm-hmm. then people will come back and read book three. And that's what they're doing now. No big right. deal. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And it's just not panicking over that. Yes. Initial thing, which is hard. It's, it's just, very it's hard. So when you hard to do. On, yeah. yeah. The cover reveal and you're excited about a book. I mean, you just want everyone to do better than the last. And so it is, it is, I think one of the hardest things really. Yeah, I do too. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. Uh, what changes have you seen in your genre over the course of your author career and how have you adapted? So, so yeah, I always knew historical readers t- uh, trended older. I think it's one of the reasons Facebook ads can be a little bit tough in my genre. Um, mm-hmm. And I knew always there was a ceiling on historical romance. It's not mm-hmm. one of the biggest, especially medieval Scottish. If I was willing to write Regency, then maybe that would be a different story. Um, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I love reading Regency, but I am not a big fan of that many rules when I'm writing. So mm-hmm. um, I would say, you know, it hasn't gotten necessary. We haven't picked up younger readers. And mm-hmm. we talk about this a lot in the historical romance community. You know, how do we, a lot of our readers are ones we won't reach. They still are reading trad. They're in bookstores. They're, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that hasn't uh, let up, I guess you could say. So mm-hmm. in some ways it's becoming harder. And that's why I really do want to diversify. Uh, also the scammers. And I know everybody has them in every genre, but I did launch a book. I looked, you know, just this morning, shockingly. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> 10 minutes ago, I, I, you know, I'm None of us do that. We're talking here. So <laughs> in my defense, it's within, it's within the last week after a week, I do let it go a bit, but, um, in the top 10 of my genre, at least half, if not more are scammers or 99 cent books. And the visibility is definitely harder than it was last year. And it's harder last year than it was the year before. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I started in 2017 and didn't even give a wink when people started talking scammers. I was like, listen, head down. You can't control that. You can control what you can control and don't worry about them. That's great advice. (laughs) Um, And I do try to take it. But also when you look at your genre and your, you know, your lesson, know that your visibility is hurting because of it. Yeah. Again, can't do anything about it. You know, these black hat strategies will exist and will continue to, especially if someone in KU, but it's, uh, it's definitely not gotten any. Um, yeah. It's idea. another one of those like mindset things that like you have to know it's out there and do what you can to deal with it. But a lot of it's just out of our control. So it is. Yeah. And maybe some strategies have to change. I mean, um, but for the most part, you're absolutely right. Like yeah. there's not much we can do about the scammers. I think they'll always exist in some capacity. Yeah. So when you said a lot of the readers are in trad, so you're talking about younger readers are reading trad published books in your genre or? No, no. I think a lot of historical readers are, are, are still older. Yeah. And I think okay. they're 
they're reading in trad and reading in paperback. And so I've actually talked to some authors about, and I have some historical romance friends, their strategy is to be hybrid. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that. Might, yeah. That might yeah, be and do that kind of thing. And so that's, you know, because I do want to be in historical forever. It's where mm-hmm. my heart is. I absolutely love it. Um, so, you know, if, if I ever did look at that particular journey, you know, of trad pub, it would be for that reason to reach a, a mm-hmm. different readership mm-hmm. specifically in Scottish historical romance where I know there are re- readers, but the practicality of that, I, I don't see it happening anytime soon. The idea right. of writing a book and not putting it out. Um, it just, it gives me chills. <laughs> well, yeah. Because when you write a book for a trad publisher, that's one less, I mean, yeah, especially for me, cause I take so long. I mean, that's one less book mm-hmm. that you're writing for yourself. And yes. yeah, it's, that's a hard, if you write really fast and, and you do tend to write faster, um, it might be a big deal, but yeah, it's still hard isn't it, to say. Yeah, no. it is. It is. And I, I feel like I might just leave, keep myself at one big risk per year. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a good plan. Crazy. Yeah. Like, let's try this out and see what happens. Yeah. Um, so maybe that could be yeah. 2021. Who knows? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So my- mystery is sort of the same as the readers skew older and I've had a lot of success with print recently. And so one of my new strategies is like getting all the books in paperback and I'm doing large print and trying to get them in libraries and stuff. So that's been, you know, a new thing that I'm trying to do. So that might well, be. You're doing well at that. though. Yeah, it's, it's going, going well. well. Yeah, it's definitely harder to track, though, because like, you know, if you go look at your Amazon rank- rankings, it doesn't show anything. You know, it has no impact on that. So it's. But it's, they are getting out there and libraries are buying them. So that might be another, you know, possibility for people who have genres that are uh, a little bit older, maybe not so, so into the eBooks. So, yeah, I I would absolutely love to hear some of your strategies. I have (laughs) um, the books on Ingram. I actually tested out paper, uh, sorry, hardcovers with this particular uh, series. So they are all listed now in paperback and in hardcover and Ingram. So that should be on my to-do list. Um, yeah. yeah. The large yeah. print might really work for you, Cecilia. I've thought mm-hmm. of that too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So stick. Thanks ladies. And I have a larger to-do list today. <laughs> yeah. but oh, I sorry. Didn't that. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> okay. So um, what's the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success in your author career? The best thing I've done to set myself up for success has been to, I think really cultivate what the reader's the reader avatar, so to say, um, you know, and knowing what my readers want. And I did that even before I put out the very first book, I started with my social media because I had social media platforms and I started to ask questions. Okay. All these people on Twitter, does anybody read romance books? What do you like? What do you read? Uh, where do you read? How do you read? And I did that on Instagram. I did it on Facebook. I did it on Twitter because I had, again, those, a lot of my blogger followers tended to be, um, because I was kind of, I hate this term now, but mom blogger. So um, Mm -hmm. there were a lot of moms and there were people that read. And so I have known because I kind of came from marketing that it was really important for me to understand the reader. Um, I obviously lost sight of that a bit when I decided that vampires were my life, but now uh, (laughs) just a little detour, (laughs) your your eternal life. Yeah. (laughs) My eternal life. I can't stop with the puns. I'm sorry. (laughs) No. So I think, I think doing that. And so kind of jumping into the, pen name, I'm doing exactly that same thing and really trying to get a pulse on, I've read romance for my, my entire life. And I've read a lot of my friends, contemporary romances, um, just because they're my friends, but now really getting my pulse on what makes the contemporary romance reader tick. Mm -hmm. What do those beats look like as opposed to the historical? What, what is, you know, I've never written first person. So navigating what that (laughs) To what changes that will bring and such and practicing that, um, you know, so I'm kind of taking those same lessons from the first platform build and, and using them again. Um, but I'm, I'm going to do some things different this time. I'm really hesitant and I'll be honest where I'm at today is not real sure, but I did a lot of platform build things the first time before I had a book out, you know, gave away books of similar, mm-hmm. similar mm-hmm. genre and right. things like that. And I'm really kind of questioning whether I'll do that or not. And I'm, I'm still on the fence about it. Um, mm-hmm trying to keep in my historical, my lists a little bit more pure. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I won't ever do list builders or things like that, but definitely have scaled back on those. You know, I just Mm -hmm. got rid of 6,000 subscribers 
um, that I was paying for that, you know, I, I could have kept some and I, yeah. yeah. And I know that there's different mm-hmm. theories on that, whether you should keep them or get rid of them, but I, I, I got rid of them and, uh, not, not wanting to pay for people that hadn't opened in six months, a year, mm-hmm. um, even though yeah. I know the opens are hard to track. And again, there's lots of theories on that, but I do think I want to cultivate an audience this time that is excited about the exact thing I plan to offer them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but being very mm-hmm. deliberate on that, again, going back to having learned that, yeah, I have to look at this through a marketing lens. Everyone mm-hmm. says this is a business, right? If you're right. publishing mm-hmm. indie publishing, it is a business, but I'm not, I'm not sure I understood what that meant until now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was actually at Nink when someone mentioned the idea of reverse engineering is like, Oh, that's so clinical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do that. Why would I do that? <laughs> and now here I am. Yeah. 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 It's true. And you, when you hear people say, write the book you want to, you know, write the book you want to write, that'll make you so happy. It's true. I mean, mm-hmm. you can do that. You but have to, yeah. you have to also know that, that if you don't look at the stuff you're talking about, that book may not find a place. And that yeah. to me, that's sad because you've spent all this time and it is the book you wanted to write. So mm-hmm. wouldn't you want it to have a home as well? So I think you can do both. You just you have can. to be, you have to be deliberate about it. You can. And I would never jump into um, a genre, you know, and I don't know some people will, and I'm not judging at all. I mean, I absolutely think it is a business and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know, you, you have to treat it that way. I personally would have to enjoy reading it. And yeah. for me, um, I couldn't write just anything, you know, mm-hmm. I mentioned Regency. I absolutely love Regency. The market is there in Regency. It's much better than medieval or Scottish or combined but I won't be writing it because I know that even if it would be a good business decision, mm-hmm. it's just not a good fit for me. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm still looking at that as well. And uh, I, I, I personally can't write anything that I wouldn't be excited to sit down and write. Yeah. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But that's really smart because you're taking into account what you enjoy and what you want to do as well as the market. And it's like, you're taking like a, a big picture, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes it just like, for me, it took me a long time to get to that point where I was like, Oh, if I write this series that I really like the idea of, I will also have people I can advertise to, you know, like I'll have those comp authors Mm -hmm. and, you know, just things like that, that I didn't even think about in the beginning. So yeah, Yeah, things. Absolutely. So besides the, the vampire book, is there, do you have another wish I'd known then moment in your writing career? Something that you just wish you'd known at the beginning that. Yeah. I wish I had known, um, and I guess inherently I did how important friends would be and how important networking would be. Mm-hmm. But I, I think I undervalued the importance of those relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to conferences in the beginning because I love being around people. I miss <laughs> colleagues. It's just who I am. Yeah. And I went and I went to parties and I had great time and it was lots of fun. And now I realize, you know, for example, you know, just looking back two years, well, yeah, I probably, if I really was jumping into paranormal, I, I should have spent maybe a one or two less minutes with my buddies and <laughs> had gone out and sought people who wrote paranormal romance. But I right. didn't do that because, um, again, I'm a social pe- person and I was like, well, I'm with my friends and this is mm-hmm. really great. Again, putting that business hat on too mm-hmm. and realizing that. But I do think that those relationships, you know, my relationship with the historical author community can't be just it's it's everything and you guys probably i'm sure have the same in your own genres Mm -hmm. Um, having the genuine support of people who believe in what you do and your work Mm -hmm. is super super important and uh and that's actually one of the daunting things about jumping into a new genre Mm -hmm. i found some great paranormal people as well and doing that again seems a little bit overwhelming but now i understand how important that is to this um, career i would say it's one of the most important things that networking and, and for me, which is why I find value in conferences. Some people say, well, it's away from writing time and it does cost a lot of money, but you will never find me at less than two a year. It's just yeah. part of my strategy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, last year I was conference queen, but me too. Year, <laughs> you um, and I were like were, buying for the crown. We, we were on the, on the float as the parade went by. Um, we were. Yeah, I, yeah. But this year I'm, I'm only going to two. I, Thing, I think, but yeah, right now I'm only going to two, but, um, yeah, I would say that if you're in a, if you're in a genre and you don't have author friends in your genre, that needs to be, 
at the top of your priority list. Yeah, because Mm -hmm. so important. And and Mm -hmm. if you're in a genre with people who are not supporting you as a peer and a colleague, you need to find new friends because they're out there and it's just super important to have Mm -hmm. those people. If for no Mm -hmm. other reason, just to call somebody up and say, today is not a good day for me and Mm -hmm. have them talk you off the ledge. And uh, so. I think yeah. that's really good. And I'm an introvert I and I agree about going to conferences and meeting people. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard like, for me to get out, of, get out of my shell. Yeah. But then once I'm out there, I really enjoy it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's important. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I think, I think it's, it's, um, and as um, Jamie mentioned too, even the mental health part of it, you know, mm-hmm. being, I was excited to talk to you guys. I'm like I'm going to see people. <laughs> <laughs> so Which is, is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's very good. So where can people find you, Cecilia? So they can find me pretty much Cecilia Mecca everywhere. Um, I'm most active on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, believe it or not, as I mentioned. So I do love, love to connect with other authors there. So but pretty much at Cecilia Mecca and authors, as you mentioned, again, thanks for that launching indie. That was just kind of a passion project. Yes. I, I do like being a part of groups and being able to connect with authors on mm-hmm. Facebook because you're not, I'm not necessarily doing it in real life. I don't have an author's group here in, in Chile, Northeast PA. So, um, <laughs> but I wanted a place that was really focused on just the positive stuff because you can get really bogged down and Amazon's broke and I hate this. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So I just wanted a place where this is all about things that can go right. Um, right. there's a lot of that too. Right. So that's launching indie on Facebook yeah. and that's face. That's a private Facebook boot group yeah. that you have to join. Um, yep. Asked to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, uh, we're so glad you were here with us today. Like I said, I was looking forward to this. So thank you <laughs> for the amazing writing break and letting me actually speak with human beings. Today. I know. So it, it was good to talk get to those you. words out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, ladies. And good All luck right. on the podcast. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Men podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.